This is Brave New World, written by Aldous Huxley, read by Brittany George. Chapter 1 A squat grey building of only 34 stories, over the main entrance the words Central London Hatchery and Conditioning Centre, and, in a shield, the world state motto, Community, Identity, Stability. The enormous room on the ground floor faced towards the north, cold for the summer beyond the panes, for the tropic heat of the room itself, a harsh thin light glared through the windows, hungrily seeking some draped lay figure, some pallid shape of ap- academic goose flesh, but finding only a glass and nickel and bleakly shining porcelain of a laboratory. Windresses responded to windresses. The overalls of the workers were white, their hands gloved in pale corpse-colored rubber. The light was frozen, dead, a ghost. Only from the yellow barrels of the microscopes did it borrow a certain rich and loving substance, lying along polished tubes like butter, streak after luscious streak along recession down the work tables. And this, said the director opening the door, is the fertilizing room. Bent over their instruments, three hundred fertilizers were plunged as the director of hatcheries and conditioning entered the room. In a scarcely breathing silence, the absent-minded soliloquizing hum of the or whistle of absorbed concentration a troop of newly arrived students very young pink and callow followed nervously rather ob- objectively at the director's heels each of them carried a notebook in which whenever the great man spoke he desperately scribbled straight from the horse's mouth it was a rare privilege the dhc for central london made a point of personally conducting his new students around the various departments. Just to give you a general idea, he would explain to them, for the course of some general idea they must have, if they were to do their work intelligently, through as little of one, they were to be good and happy members of society as possible. For particulars, as everyone knows, make for virtue and happiness, generalities and intellectually necessity evils. Not full officers, but fresh sawyers, and stamp collectors composed the backbone of society. Tomorrow, he would add, smiling at them with a slightly menacing geniality, you'll be settled down to serious work. You won't have for time for generalities. Meanwhile, meanwhile, it was a privilege. Straight from the horse's mouth into the notebook, the boy scribbled like mad. Tall and rather thin but upright, the director advanced into the room. He had a long chin and big, rather prominent teeth, just covered, when he was not talking, by his full, floridly curved mouth. Old? Young? Thirty? Fifty? Fifty-five? It was hard to say. And anyhow, the question didn't arise. In this year of stability, AF 632, it didn't occur to you to ask. I shall begin at the beginning, said the DHC and the more zealous students recorded his intentions in their notebooks. Begin at the beginning. These, he waved his hand, are incubators. And opening an insulated door, he showed racks upon racks of numbered test tubes. The weak supply of ova kept, he he explained, at blood heat, whereas male gametes, and here he opened another door, they have to be kept at 35 instead of 37, full blood heat sterilizers. Ram, rams rubbed, in thermogene begot no lamps still leaning against the incubators he gave them while the pencil scurried illegibly across the pages a brief description of a modern fertilizing process spoke first of course of its surgical introduction the operations undergone voluntary for the good of society not to mention the fact that it carries out a bonus amounting to six months salary continued in some account of the technique for preserving the exercised ovary alive and actively developing, passed on to a consideration of optimum temperature, salinity, viscosity, referred to the liquor in which they detached and ripened eggs were kept, and leading his charges to the work tables actually showed them how this liquor was drawn off the test tubes, how it would let out a drop by drop onto the specially warm slides of the microscopes, how the eggs which it contains were inspected for abnormalities counted and transferred to a porous receptacle how and how and he now took the watch of the operation this receptacle was immersed in a warm bullion containing free swimming spermatosa 
at a minimum concentration of 100,000 per cubic centimeter, he insisted, and how, after 10 minutes, the container was lifted out of the liquor and its contents re-examined. How, if any of the eggs remained unfertilized, it was again immersed, and if necessary, yet again, and how the fertilized ova went back into the incubators, where the alphas and betas remained until the def definitely bottled, while the gammas, deltas, and epsilons were brought out again after only 36 hours to undergo Boscanovi's process. Boscanovi's process, repeated the director, and the students underlined the words in their little notebooks. One egg, one embryo, one adult. Normality. But a Boscanovified egg will bud, will proliferate, will divide from 8 to 96 buds, and every bud will grow into a perfectly formed embryo, and every embryo into a full-sized adult, making 96 human beings grow where only one grew before. Progress. Essentially, the DHC concluded, Boscanification consists of a series of arrests of development. We check normal growth and, paradoxically enough, the egg responds by budding. Responds by budding. The pencils were busy. He pointed. On a very slowly moving band of rack full of test tubes was entering a large metal box. Another rack full was emerging. Machinery faintly purred. It took eight minutes for the tubes to go through, he told them, eight minutes of hard x-rays being about as much of an egg can stand. A few died, the rest, at least susceptible, divided into two. The most, most put out four buds, some eight. All were returned to the incubators, where the buds began to develop, then, after two days, were suddenly chilled, chilled, and checked. Two, four, eight. The buds in their turn budded, and have budded or dosed almost to death with alcohol, consequently burgened again by having budded, bud out of bud out of bud, were thereafter further arrested by being generally fatal, left to develop in peace, by which time the original egg was far a far in a fair way to becoming anything from eight to ninety six embryos prejudice movement. You will agree on nature. Identical twins, but not in piddling twos and threes, as in old vib vibrous ways, when the egg would sometimes accidentally divide, actually by dozens, the scores at a time. Scores? The director repeated and flung out his arms as though they were distributing largesses. Scores. But one of the students was a fool enough to ask where the advantage lie. My good boy, the director wheeled sharply around him. Can't you see? Can't you see? He raised a hand. His expression was solemn. Boscanovi's process is one of the major instruments of social stability. Major instruments of social stability. Standard men and women in uniform batches, the whole of the small factory staffed with products of single Boscanovified egg. 96 identical twins ni working 96 identical machines. The voice was almost tremulous and with enthusiasm. You really know where you are, for the first time in history. He quoted the planetary motto, community, identity, stability, grand words. If we could Boscanovify indefinitely, the whole problem would be solved. Solved by standard gammas, unvarying deltas, uniform epsilons, millions of identical twins, the principle of mass production at last applied to bi biology. But alas, the director shook his head, we can't boscify indefinitely. 96 seemed to be a limit, 72 a good average from the same ovary and with gametes of the same male to manufacture as many batches of identical twins as possible, and that was the best, sadly, a second best, that they could do, and even that was difficult. For in nature, it takes 36, 30 years for 200 eggs to reach maturity. But our business is to stabilize the population at this moment, here and now. Dribbling out twins over a quarter of a century, what would be the use of that? Obviously, no use at all. But Podsnap's technique had immensely accelerated the process of ripening. They could make sure of at least 150 mature eggs within two years, fertilized and boscanovified. 
In other words, multiply by 72 and you get an average of nearly 11,000 brothers and sisters in 150 batches of identical twins, all within two years of the same age. In exceptional cases, we can make out one ovary yield to us over 15,000 adult individuals, beckoning to a fair-haired, ruddy young man who happened to be passing at the moment. Mr. Foster, he called. The ruddy man approached. Can you tell us a record for every single ovary, Mr. Foster? 16,012 in this center, said Mr. Foster without hesitation. He spoke very quickly and had a vicious blue eye, vivacious blue eye, and he took an evident pleasure in quoting figures, 16,012 and 189 batches of identicals. But of course, they done much better, he rattled on, and some of the trop tropical centers, Singapore, has often produced over 16,500, and Mombasa has actually touched the 17,000 mark. But then they have an unfair advantage. You should see the way a Negro ovary responds to pituitary. It's quite astonishing. When you used to working with European material, still, he added with a laugh, but the light of combat was in his eyes and the lift of his chin was challenging. Still, we mean to beat them if we can. I'm working on a wonderful Delta Minus ovary at this moment. Only just 18 months old, over 12,700 children already, either decanted or in embryo, and still going strong. We'll beat them yet. That's a spirit I like, cried the director, and clapped Mr. Foster on the shoulder. Come along with us and give these boys a benefit of your expert knowledge. Mr. Foster smiled modestly. With pleasure, they went, and the bottling room was all harmonious bustle and ordered activity, flaps of fresh sow's peritoneum already cut into the proper size came shooting up with little lifts from the organ store in the sub basement whiz and then click the lift hatch flew open bottle liner had only reached out a hand take the flap insert smooth down and before the lined bottle had the time to travel out of the reach along the endless band whiz click another flap of peritoneum had shot up from the depths already to be slipped into yet another bottle and the next of that slow interminable process on the band next to the liner stood the matriculars the process the procession advanced one by one the eggs were transferred from their test tubes to a large containers deftly the peritoneal lining was slit the morale dropped into place, the saline solution poured in, and already the bottle had passed, and it was turn of the labelers, heredity, date of fertilization, membership of Boscanovi's group. Details were transferred from test tube to bottle, no longer anonymous but named, identified. The procession marched on slowly, on through the opening wall, slowly into the social predization room. 88 cubic centimeters cubic meters of card index said mr foster with relish as they entered containing all relevant information and the director added the director brought up date every morning and co and coordinated every afternoon on the basis of which they make their calculations so many individuals of such and such quality said mr foster distributed in such and such qualities the optimum decanting rate at any given moment. Unforeseen wastages promptly make good. Promptly, repeated Mr. Foster. If you knew the amount of overtime I had to put in after the Japanese earthquake, he laughed good humoredly and took his head and shook his head. The predestiners sent their figures to the fertilizers, who gave them embryos they asked for, and the bottles come here to be predestined in detail, after which they are sent down to the embryo store where we are now proceed ourselves. And opening a door, Mr. Foster led the way down the staircase to the basement. The temperature was still tropical. They descended into a thickening twilight. Two doors and a passage of double turn ensured the cellar against the possible infiltration of the day. Embryos are like photograph film, said Mr. Fast Foster wagishly. He pushed open the second door. They can only stand red light. 
and the effect of sultry darkness into which the students now followed him were visible in crimson, like the darkness of closed eyes on a summer afternoon. The bulging flakes of now receding row and tier above tier of bottles glinted with innumerable rubies, and among the rubies moved a dim red spectre of men and women with purple eyes and all symptoms of lupus. The hum and rattle of machinery faintly stirred the air. Give them a few figures, Mr. Foster, said the director, who was now tired of talking. Mr. Foster was only too happy to give them a few figures. Two hundred and twenty meters long, two hundred wide, ten high. He pointed upwards. Like chickens drinking, the students lifted their eyes towards the distant ceiling. Three tiers of racks, ground floor level, first gallery, second gallery. The spidery steel work of the gallery above gallery faded in all directions into the dark near them three red ghosts were busily unloading demijohns from a moving staircase the escalator from the social predization room each bottle could be placed on one of fifteen racks each rack though you couldn't see it it was conveyor traveling at the rate of thirty three and a third centimeters an hour two hundred and sixty seven days at eight meters a day two thousand one hundred and thirty six meters in all one circuit of the cellar at ground level one on the first gallery half on the second and on the two hundred and sixty seven morning daylight in the decanting room independent existence so called but in interval mr foster concluded we've managed to do a lot of them oh a very great deal his laugh was knowing and triumphant. "'That's the spirit I like,' said the director once more. "'Let's walk around. You'll tell them everything, Mr. Foster.' Mr. Foster duly told them, told them of growing embryo on the bed of peritoneum, made them taste the rich blood surrogate on which it fed, explained it, explained why it had to be simulated with placentin and thyroxin, told them of the corpus luteum, extract showed them the jets through which every twelfth meter of from zero to two thousand and forty it was automatically injected spoke of those gradually increasing doses of pituitary administered during the final ninety six meters of their course described the artificial maternal circulation and solid in every bottle at meter one hundred and twelve showed them the reservoir of blood surrogate a centrifuge pump that kept the liquid moving over the placenta and drew and drove it through the synthetic lug, synthetic lung, and waste product filter, referred it to the embryo's troublesome tendency to anemia, and the massive doses of hog stomach extract and fetal fowl's liver, with which, in consequence, had to be supplied, showed them a simple mechanism by which by means of which, during the last two meters of every eight, all the embryos were simultaneously shaken into familiarity with movement, hinted at the gravity of so-called trauma of decanting, and enumerated and the precautions of taking to minimize the suitable training of bottled embryo, that dangerous shock, told them to test for sex carried out in the neighborhood of meter 200, explained the symptom, system of labeling, a T for the males, a circle for the females, and those who worked destined to become free martins, a question mark, black on a white ground. For, of course, said Mr. Foster, in the vast majority of cases, fertility is merely a nuisance. One fertile ovary in 1,200, that would really be quite sufficient for our purposes, but we want to have a good choice, and of course, one must always have an enormous margin of safety, so we allow as many as 30% per of the female embryos to develop more normally. The other get a dose of the male sex hormone every 24 meters for the rest of the course. Results, they're decanted as free martins, structurally quite normal, except, if we had to admit, they do have the slightest tendency to grow beards, but sterile, guaranteed sterile, which brings us to at last, continued Mr. Foster, out of the realm of mere salvage imitation, the nature to much more interesting world of human in invention, he rubs his hands, for of course they didn't content themselves with merely hatching out of embryos, any cow could do that. 
We also predestine and condition. We decant our babies as socialized human beings, as alphas or epsilons, as future sewage workers or future, he was going to say future world controllers, but correcting himself, he said future directors of hatcheries. Instead, the DHC acknowledged the compliment with a smile. They were passing meter 320 on rack 11. A young beta minus mechanic was busy with a screwdriver and spanner on the blood surrogate pump of a passing bottle. The hum of electric motor, motor deepened in fractions of a tone as he turned the nuts down, down, a final twist and glanced at the revolution counter. He was done. He moved two paces down the line and began the same process to the next pump, reducing the number of revolutions per minute, Mr. Foster explained. The surrogate goes round slower, therefore passes through the lung of long intervals. Therefore, gives the embryo less oxygen. Nothing like oxygen shortage for keeping an embryo below par. Again, he rubbed his hands. But why do you want to keep the embryo below par? Asked the ingenious, ingenious student. Asked, said the director, breaking the long silence. Hasn't it occurred to you that an epsilon embryo must have an epsilon environment as well as an epsilon heredity? It evidently hadn't occurred to him. He was covered with confusion. The lower caste, said Mr. Foster, the shorter the oxygen. The first organ affected was the brain, after that the skeleton. At 70% of normal oxygen, you got dwarfs. At less than 70, eyeless monsters, who are no use at all, concluded Mr. Foster, whereas his voice became confidential and eager. If they could discover a technique for shortening the period of maturation, what a triumph, what a benefaction, to society. Consider the horse. They considered it. Mature at six, the elephant at ten, while at thirteen a man is not yet sexually mature and is mo only full grown at twenty. Hence, of course, the fruit of delayed development in human intelligence. But in epsilons, said Mr. Foster just very justly, we don't need human intelligence. Didn't need and didn't get it. But the thought of an epsilon mind was mature at ten. The epsilon body was not fit to work until eighteen. Long years of superfluous and wasted immaturity. If the physical development could be speeded up till it was quick, say, as a cow's, what an enormous saving to the community. Enormous, mur murmured the students. Mr. Foster's enthusiasm was infectious. He became rather technical, spoke of the abnormal endocrine coordination, which made men grow slowly postulated a germinal mutation to account for it. Could the effects of this germinal mutation be undone? Could the individual epsilon embryo be made revert by a suitable technique to the normally normality of dogs and cows? That was the problem, and it was all solved. Pil Pilkington and Mombasa had produced individuals who were sexually mature at four and full-grown at six and a half. Scientific triumph, but socially useless. A six-year-old men and women were too stupid to even epsilon work. And the process was all for nothing. One, either you failed to modify it all, or else you modified the, modified the whole way. They were still trying to find the ideal compromise between adults of 20 and adults of six. So far without success, Mr. Foster sighed and shook his head. Their wanderings through the crimson twilight had brought them to a neighborhood of meter 170 on rack 8. From this point onwards, rack 9 was enclosed and the bottles performed the remainder of their journey in the kind of tunnel interrupted here and there by openings two or three meters wide. Heat conditioning, said Mr. Foster. Hot tunnels alternating with cool tunnels. Coolness was wedded to discomfort in the form of hard x-rays. By the time they were decanted, the embryos had a horror of cold. They were predestined to emigrate to the tropics, to be miners and acetate silk spinners and steel workers. Later on, their minds would be made to endorse in judgment of their bodies. We conditioned them to thrive on heat, concluded Mr. Foster. Our colleagues upstairs would teach them to love it. And that put the director sententially... That is the secret of happiness and virtue, liking what you've got to do. All conditioning aims at that, making people like their unescapable social destiny. In gap between two tunnels, a nurse was delicately propping, probing 
With a long, fine syringe into the gelinous contents of a passing bottle, the students and their guides stood watching her, her for a few moments, in silence. Well, Lenina, said Mr. Foster. When the last one she drew the syringe and straightened herself up, the girl turned and with a start. One could see that, for all the lupus and her purple eyes, she was uncommonly pretty. Henry! Her smile flashed readily at him, a row of coral teeth. Charming, charming, murmured the director, and giving her two or three little pats, receiving in exchange a rather differential smile for him. What are you giving them? asked Mr. Foster, making his tone very professional. Oh, the usual typhoid and sleeping sickness. Tropical workers start by being inoculated at meter 150, Mr. Foster explained to the students. The embryos still have gills. We amuse the fish against the future man diseases. Then turning back to Lenina, five to ten on the roof this afternoon, he said, as usual. Charming, said the director once more, and with a final pat moved away after the others. On rack ten, rows of next generation's chemical workers were being trained on the toleration of lead, caustic soda, tar, chlorine. The first of the batch of 250 embryonic rocket plane engineers was just passing the 1100 meter mark on rack three. A special mechanism keep their containers in constant rotation to improve their sense of balance, Mr. Foster explained. Doing repairs on outside of a rocket in mid-air is tickling sh ticklish job. We, s <clears throat> we slacken off the circulation when they're right way up so that they're half starved. The double of the flow of surrogate when they're upside down. They learn to associate topsy turvitum as well-being. In fact, they're only truly happy when they're standing on their heads. And now, Mr. Foster went on, I'd like to show you some very interesting conditioning for Alpha Plus intellectuals. We have a big batch of them in Rack 5, first gallery level. He called two boys who had started to go down to the ground floor. The roundabout meter 900, he explained. You can't really do any useful intellectual conditioning till the photuses have lost their tails. Till the fetuses have lost their tails. Follow me. But the director had looked at his watch. Ten to three, he said. No time for intellectual embryos, I'm afraid. We must go up to nurseries before the children have finished their afternoon sleep. Mr. Foster was disappointed. At least one glance in the decanting room, he pleaded. Very well, then. The director smiled indulgently. Just one glance. Thanks for reading with me today. If you liked this video, make sure to like and subscribe.